This episode is dedicated to Comrade Sparkles and Sung Min for becoming our newest Southpaw supporters and helping to make this project possible. This is Sam. This is Jason. And this is Fight Study. Coach Jason and I are back to discuss Vicente Luque versus Bilal Muhammad II. They first fought back in 2016 and have both moved up the rankings, so it was time for them to fight again. Muhammad ended up winning this time by unanimous decision, all the while fasting for Ramadan. Something you mentioned in our preview, Jason, was how intelligent Muhammad is. And we not only saw that in this fight, but after the fight and after all of his fights, he puts on sunglasses as what appears to be for concussion protocol. So I think that's a good idea for all fighters, even if you didn't get knocked down or dropped, just do it just in case. That's something also Stephen Wonderboy Thompson does, regardless of the fight. He likes to just keep the lights low, wear sunglasses, and just do the whole concussion protocol, even if he hasn't been diagnosed with a concussion, just to be on the safe side. So I think that's really smart of him. And also, tells you a bit about the character of Muhammad, how he thinks, how he approaches fighting. Now, during his speech, Muhammad gave a shout out to Palestine and the Palestinian struggle. And even in progressive MMA media, you don't see this topic mentioned much, even though politics does get brought up a lot. And I have to assume it's because Israel is a U.S. ally. Despite what Israel does to Palestine, they'll never call it authoritarian as they do for other countries. Despite what the U.S. does in Afghanistan, it's not authoritarian. There's a very clear double standard, even for the progressive wing of MMA media. This is more an editorial note for listeners. Before you fawn over how certain MMA writers point out certain bad things in MMA, notice what they won't point out, what they won't talk about. Muhammad's politics get ignored, which is part of why Muhammad gets ignored. Now, with all that said, let's talk about the fight. This is one of those fights where both fighters fought well, but one camp did a much better job than the other in scouting out their opponent and doing their homework. We talked about Muhammad not getting discouraged if he can't get takedowns and just trying to bank rounds and win rounds and just win. And we saw that in this fight. We talked about Luque's counters and pinpoint left hooks. We saw that also. Yet Muhammad still clearly won this fight. So let's first talk about Muhammad. What did he do well in this fight, and what adjustments did he make, Jason? Well, first and foremost, uh, Bilal Muhammad came to win a fight, and he came in with a game plan to win a fight, Um, whereas Vincente Luque came to knock someone out. And that's, I think, the the advantage falls to to Bilal in those set of circumstances. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go against the grain uh, and say, regardless of Vincente Luque's walk and stock forward pressure, it was uh, it was uh, Muhammad that had actual cage control. You know, when when you can determine the how, why, and when someone changes their stance in a fight, my question is who was controlling who? That was really how the fight played out. And shifted or slid and played the perimeter while while Luke continued to stalk and was very predictable in the way he was approaching Bilal's movement and. At, at some point, when you're that predictable, it's going to open up opportunities for strikes, which Bilal landed plenty of strikes. He was quick. Also, his takedown entries, all set up on the predictability and easily timed movement of Vincente Luque. Yeah, it looked badass, but I mean, at the end of the day, half your purse is predicated on winning the fight. So, you know, win that fucking fight. It reminded me a bit of the old school pride fight between Rico Rodriguez versus Minotaro Noguera, where Noguera is clearly the prettier striker, you know, on paper, the better striker. But Rico Rodriguez was actually outlanding him with his ugly strikes. And a lot of that was the same thing, his movement, where he would just keep moving around, moving around. And then he would dictate when he would set his feet and attack. And so every time Noguera chased him, Rodriguez would stop, set his feet when Noguera wasn't ready and just pot shot him a few times. 
And that still works years later, as Bilal Muhammad showed in this fight, as Aljamain Sterling showed in his fight against Peter Yan, which is something we were talking about off air. But it is a game plan that isn't new. It's something that's been around. And you were speaking to that, this ability to work the perimeter. Well, yeah, it's that that walk and stop forward pressure. If it's if it's very predictable when you're going against someone and, and you, you said it perfectly, uh, you dictate when you set your own feet while the other person is following. So you saw it with Aljo. Aljo was able to do it. Who's a better striker, Aljo or Jan? Obviously Jan. But Aljo is quick enough and is a competent enough striker that if he determines when he wants to go while the other guy is com- committed to follow, he outstruck Jan, right? In, in multiple, multiple portions of that fight where he didn't backpack him. Yeah, we can go to the fourth and fifth, but right? it was the, the timing uh, of Bilal Muhammad playing the perimeter and dictating when he set his own feet well, he caught the other when he caught. Well, he caught Vincente Luque in stance switches and transitions. And if you do the same shit over and over, rinse and repeat, and you think it looks badass because you're just sliding and shuffling, sliding and shuffling, while well, the other person is just saying, "Okay, every time I go this way, he gives me this stance." Now you know what to do. And it looked like one person had an idea of what the other person was doing, and you have sort of like a broken rhythm, disjointed striking style of Bilal Muhammad. But it was it was more effective throughout the entire fight than uh, mixed in with the takedowns, especially than uh, than Vincente Luque's. What was the key to Muhammad's takedown entries? Because Luque is not an easy person to take down. Timing and uh, pre- the predictability of Luque, and that was how was that how was that born? Right, it was born of Bilal Muhammad playing the perimeter and sliding and sliding, and if. Here's the problem with what, what Luke does. Here's the problem with what Jan does. Their inability to take three steps back, point to the center, and reset. You don't have to consistently follow. You just don't, especially when you're fighting someone who is intent on wrestling. And I'm tired of hearing the wrestlers can't wrestle off that back foot. That's wrong. You can wrestle off that back foot. Before the push-out rule in international wrestling, wrestlers did it all the time, caught people over-aggressive and, and caught them coming in. Um, in fighting, when you're in a, a, a taller stance with your hands up, it's completely different too. So if you're predictable in your forward march and someone else is a little bit disjointed in their rhythm um, in, in their in their style, then there's a lot you have to look at. You have to look at them poking you with pot shots, lunging in with the jab, as both Aljo uh, and Bilal Mohammed did. And that, those were landing. Then all of a sudden, your eyes are high, and then you take a step forward, and they lower their level, and they beat you to your hips. And they're running you towards the center of the cage, center of the octagon, center of the mat, and they're, they're, they're allowed to set up shop there. So that's that's how I saw it. And I think, um, yeah, the forward pressure, that, that forward march, that aggressive shit, hey, it, it looks really good. But I think you're you're starting to see some fighters, especially – the ones that may have, um, I don't want to say a striking deficit. They're, these these fighters at the highest level are more than competent. And this is what I asked asked you. How else do you plan on someone with Bilal Mohammed's skill set beating a Vincente Luque? Tell me how. Tell me how. Because if you think you're going to come at it and you're going to you're going to like come storming out the gate like he did in that first fight, you're going to knock the fuck out. And if you tell me if you had, if you were a fighter and you had Bilal Muhammad's skill set, you wouldn't have approached it the same way. Well, I would say you were either a liar or an asshole. <laughs> that's it. Because those are the gifts and those are the, that's the skill set that Bilal Muhammad has. And he fought a guy that beat him handily the last time. And in my opinion, he won this, this fight this time around four rounds to one. So you mentioned something here where you don't need to stock. You can also step back to the center of the cage and reset. How is that a useful strategy? When should I use that? What is the point of that strategy? I honestly think the earlier the better. Because if you can get it into your opponent's head that you're not just going to follow, number one, the optics look terrible if you keep taking center and the other person keeps giving ground. Right? So you get those optics out there early and it forces them to reconsider that game plan. If it looks terrible, but you run into 12 jabs and you only land four in a leg kick, well, you lose that round. 
right? But if he doesn't, if he's not able to get off any jabs because you didn't over pursue and you just keep resetting, you keep resetting. And then that fighter has to determine whether or not he wants to, to continue down that path, have the judges uh, look on it as lack of aggression or the other fighter having cage control or even the fans boo. You can put some more pressure both psychologically and in real time on that fighter, on your opponent to break from their game plan rather than just saying, fuck it. I do what I do. I don't care what they do. Well, that's why you fucking lose, man. So shut up and move on. That's actually a good point, right? There's more than one type of pressure. There's the physical pressure, but then with stepping back and using the optics and the fans against you, there's psychological pressure you can create. That's something that people don't think about how a fighter can use. You know how they say you can use the fence as like a third arm when you're taking somebody down? Well, it's like almost like uh, using the fans and the way the judging criteria works as another weapon against the psyche of your opponent, right? So that's something that resetting and making them look like they're not wanting to engage can do. It puts that pressure and maybe they come in too aggressive or they make mistakes, right? Because they feel that pressure. No, absolutely. You you nailed it. The other thing is about octagon control that you were talking about. By stepping back and making them now follow you, even though you're moving backwards, you're dictating how your opponent is moving. Then who's the one who really has octagon control, right? Mm -hmm, For sure. So it's another way to control octagon, which isn't to just chase somebody like an asshole. Octagon control is more about how you dictate where they are in the octagon. It doesn't always have to be against the perimeter. It just means you lead where the fight happens. That is what control means, right? So I think people have to recalibrate, just like they have to recalibrate what composure was in the last episode, they have to recalibrate what it means to control a fighter, what pressure means in a fight. Without a doubt. And it all, and it, and what you say speaks also to strategy and counter strategy and the ability to reverse engineer someone else's counter game plan. And I don't see that happening with some of these, some of these fighters who we always talk about how, like, how skilled they are, how smart they are. Um, but if Jan and his camp didn't say, like, how would Aljo beat us? If they didn't determine that, if they didn't come up with that, okay. And then, then you see how Aljo planned to beat you. So the counter strategy is to what? To keep doing what you're doing with that forward march with your high guard and he's playing the perimeter, he's pot shot and you're on the outside, then he's beating you to takedowns. All he needs is two. Same thing with, with uh, uh, Bilal Muhammad versus Vincente Luque. What is the counter strategy to that? The counter strategy should be like if, if, we're, not, if we're not winning rounds with our forward pressure in their disjointed perimeter play, is is beating us just on the scorecard? Oh, it's a fight. They or are they they won on the scorecards, but who really won the fight? What the fuck does that mean? Someone else is is moving up the rankings and taking half your pay home. So shut <laughs> up, man. So how would you counter their strategy if it's working effectively? And there seems to be very little Plan B for that because everything is aggression, aggression, aggression. And if if you're getting beat with that, that kind of layback style, well, then, then either the rules have to change. There has to be a greater degree of, um, of scoring for that forward pressure. But does anyone want to watch like forward pressure, bad fighting? I mean, that, that, that doesn't solve the problem. So, I mean, you can take, you can give some ground. You can just do the, the Diaz thing. Just take three steps back and point to the middle of the cage. And Diaz starts showing you fingers. Like, you've been backing up. He's like, that's twice. And he points to the center of the cage three times. Now, all of a sudden, he's numbering. The number of times you retreat in a round, those fingers go up to three and four. You start looking pretty fucking silly. Now, all of a sudden, he's tapped into your ego. He's tapped into your psyche. There's there's some other some other mechanisms um, of control that you can utilize to to try to give yourself uh, an advantage, not just fighting physically, but also fighting psychologically. And uh, sometimes I think these these fighters are just married to the optics of aggression. Now, Muhammad also seemed to have a read on Luke's traditional leg kick defense where he lifts his legs to check a kick. So Muhammad would use the leg kick threat to get Luke thinking. Then when Luke would preemptively lift his lead leg, Muhammad would take him down. 
so he didn't just scout out the stance switches, but he also scouted out how Luke likes to check kicks. It's all very like predictable. And I don't know if that's something they scouted out before the fight altogether, or he read that during the fight and then used it to take him down. We touched on that in the episode leading up to the fight, right? There needed to be enough offense from Bilal Muhammad to keep uh, to keep Luke honest. And then you could use that if you mixed in uh, striking and, and wrestling uh, competently, then those entries will be easier rather than just trying time after time after time to get the takedown. And like, what did we say? Maybe you win a boring decision where you just keep someone pinned against the cage, but I don't think you beat Luke that way. I think he finds you and he probably finds you with a left hook. But if he has to defend a little bit, if he has to, like, if, if you land, if you bait some things and set some things up and you start thinking how to draw out a response, you, know, you can use someone else's reads against them. And I think if you look at his, at, at uh, Bilal Muhammad's entries, they weren't random. And when we were speaking of it last week, we were talking about you have to be doing enough of each skill to keep someone honest so they can't just sit on a little level change and a little hip shift in a, or a little uh, hip drop in a, a six-inch drop to where you're landing short every time and you're putting yourself in uppercut and knee and hook range. Um, and I thought Bilal did a really good job of that. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty, but it was incredibly effective against someone who is a much, a much greater knockout risk, a much greater finisher risk than Bilal Muhammad presents. A note to our loyal listeners, if you love the Southpaw Project, please support us and help us get paid for our labor by financially supporting us on Patreon. This will give you access to exclusive bonus content, as well as our private chat group on Discord. Show your Southpaw solidarity by supporting us at patreon.com slash southpawpod. Now, was Luke finding any success in this fight? It seemed like he was off balance most of the time. I mean, the success was um, the commentary talking about his forward pressure. But in terms of striking effectiveness, he, he, he wasn't layered enough. He wasn't nuanced enough. He was just, hey, this is what I do, and I'm going to do it until it works. Um, he did land that left hook, but I mean, and he landed a couple times in a row, I think. Yeah. Right? Um, but Bilal Muhammad has only been finished once in 23, 24 fights. And they, to, to rely on that, I mean, I know you did it before, but if every time you go up the plate, you're looking for a home run, you can expect four strikeouts. It happened to Babe Ruth. How many times? It happened to Reggie Jackson. How many times? I mean, sometimes a single and a double wins you the fucking game and you can play it that way. And it, it, it seemed like that uh, it was a knockout or nothing for Vincente Luque. And because he didn't get the knockout, he got nothing. I mean, he got half his pay and a, and a loss and a drop in the rankings um, and a bunch of Twitter jerk offs talking about how one guy won a wrestling match, the other guy won a fight. <laughs> we can play that game all day. But at the end of the day, I'll say it again. If anyone on Twitter was going to fight Vincente Luque, and his skill set versus and Bilal's skill set, how else would you do it? I mean, it was it was the smartest, most effective way. And when you can four one a Vince, a Vincente Luque, who's like on winning ten of his last eleven and has a ninety percent plus finish rate, well, fuck you guys, man! <laughs> you did the right thing. Now, something you texted me during the fight was Luque needs to go back to those body kicks. To your earlier point about what Luque was finding success with, not just the left hook, he was also finding success with the body kicks. And then I think it was after consecutive left hooks where he almost knocked Bilal Muhammad out is when he stopped throwing those kicks. I think that's when you texted me because he all of a sudden became less dynamic. It wasn't like he was that layered to begin with, but he became less layered. And then after that round, it looked like he was just stalking him, looking for that left hook only. Yeah, and if you want those hands to start pinching, if you want to land that left hook, you want that right hand pinching. So you get that right hand pinching down to the hip, that left hook becomes a little bit easier to land. 
Um, and he, he didn't go to it. And even when he was in the South plus dance where you could throw a switch kick on the left side, you can get some, it's, I got to give, uh, Bilal Muhammad some credit. It's hard to get some of those kicks off when you're always sliding one way or the other, but you can slow and reset and give a little bit of ground and force, uh, Bilal to come forward, or you can lead him a specific direction and cut him off with a stance switch that isn't so obvious. And you can throw that left kick when he's fading to the right side. You can throw that and lead him to where he's going and effectively cutting someone off or saying, this is the the problem with commentary because they talk about what a good job someone is cutting off somebody. But if you're cutting someone off, but they just change direction and you don't throw anything, you haven't cut anyone off. Like all you're doing is wearing out your calves, shuffling. So let's say from a boxing perspective or a kickboxing perspective, striking perspective, what does it mean to cut somebody off? You want to beat them to where they're going. It's a little bit harder because of, uh, in, in, at least you have actual corners in a boxing ring um, and, you, and you can corner someone. And it's a little hard to exit. But in, uh, in MMA, I mean, you can still do it. It's beating them to where they're going. But if you're if you're just sort of following, so it's you're not you're not cutting anything off. You're not ahead of them. You're behind them. You're you're not. And if you get ahead of them, like, that's why feints are so important. And I I think I texted you also that I think Luke needs to go back to some feints to freeze Muhammad or get uh get him lowering his level every once in a while in anticipation of something, then catch him coming in. But it's was basically whenever uh, Bilal decided to go to the hips, he'd get it and get the takedown because there was nothing, no feints to really keep him honest. It, again, it was in like an all or nothing approach to the fight. And you know, I, I think that that kind of predictability, the inability to freeze him and cut him off. And then so you cut him off and you know he's going to change direction. Well, then now you understand and anticipate his directional change and you can lead him into those big shots. Kicking is, is essential there in MMA and you lead, you give him the exit, you get that right kick high, you give him the exit and you get that left kick to the body. I mean, you can do more than just hunt a left hook the entire time and then do that orthodox when he shifts to his left, southpaw when he shifts to his right. I mean, it was a cool whole lot of nothing, really. <laughs> Now that we're talking through this, there's something very troubling about Vicente Luque that I don't think we noticed so much in our preview, but now Bilal Muhammad has like ripped the doors wide open on it, which is that Luque might find success early on, like against Muhammad, but as the fight goes on, he stops doing a lot of the things that were the good things that was helping him find success. So to your point, the feints, he stopped feigning as the fight went on. And then the body kicks that we mentioned, he stopped throwing those as the fight went on, where by the end, he was like bare bones as far as technique. And it's something that we saw previously. And now I know it's not a one-time fluke. We saw it previously when he fought Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, where there was a lot of things he found success in in his first round against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. But as the fight progressed, he stopped doing those things. So I think that's something going forward opponents will have to acknowledge and try to use against Luke, which is that if you keep the fight going, Luke will over time become more predictable and predictable. And it's something you told me. Usually fighters go the other way. As the fight ensues, they adapt more. They find more openings. They get better, right? Whereas Luke has this habit of getting worse as the fight goes on, where by round five, Luque was losing, but he had no sense of urgency. He was still doing the same thing, this, almost the same exact thing. It was really strange. And that, that makes me think that uh, when Luque is training, that he eventually finds success. He's so fundamentally sound. Let's be honest. I don't want this isn't like Jason Sarger shooting on Vincente Luque. He's one of my favorite fighters. I think he's immensely talented. He does a lot of good stuff. But and I imagine that when you're doing rounds in, in practice and you're getting live spar on, eventually he finds the shit that works on everybody. And it's the stuff that he does 
over and over and over. But you have a five round fight. You're working with if you get taken down in, in the middle of the cage, there's no one to stand it back up so that you get work on your feet. There's a time limit and the rules of an actual fight are have fully commenced. So you can't make those mistakes. And if you can't find it in 25 minutes, you lose. You know? And against someone like uh, La Mohammed, who has a good chin, even though it's been cracked by Vincente Luque before, he also has great cardio and an excellent wrestling for MMA. So he's taking away those opportunities. And he was able to do that for the better part of a five-round fight. It's really a testament to game planning, right? It's about how better strategy can beat a more technical fighter. So it's the whole point of why you game plan. You're like, maybe on paper, we don't have the better fighter. But if we have the better game plan, our fighter can beat the better fighter. Yeah, for sure. And if and if Dana White doesn't like it, the fans don't like it, then quit with uh, everyone. That, oh, well, the, the win bonus makes people fight harder. Not if you're Bilal Muhammad, you're going to fight easier if it's an easier way to win, right? If that is your most expedient path to victory and causes you the, less da- the, the least amount of damage and allows you to compete again and get uh, up in the rankings, you'd be a fool not to do it. Everyone wants to talk about free market, free market, free market. Don't tell the motherfucker how to fight, man. Like He's going to win how he wants to win. And, he's, it, it, and if that's that place to a skill set, great. Put a quarter million dollars. You know what? Fuck that. Put a half million dollars on the line for anyone who gets fight of the night. A legit fight of the night. You want guys to come forward, throw caution to the wind, give them some kind of retirement fund. But fuck you with this. Oh, if I lose, I get half of my pay plus maybe a 50 grand kicker if if Uncle Dan is feeling da- uh, feeling generous that day. Fuck that. That's bullshit. You know? Give them a retirement fund if they put life and limb on the line for your viewing pleasure and what happens if they lose they take home half of their pay so let's up the ante if you want like a greater commitment to violence and aggression when this is supposed to be a sport that's really about winning also and stylistically if you continue to hunt for the home run each time a knuckleballer puts you on your ass a couple times and you go 0 for 3 0 for 4 then hey you know i mean every once in a while a no hitter is pretty entertaining too no, fuck it. Luke just reminded me of a fighter we just saw, Alexander Volkanovsky, except he's like the inverse version of Alexander Volkanovsky in that we've been talking a lot about Luke's stance switching, which we're making it sound like stance switching is bad, but it's not necessarily bad, right? Because Volkanovsky does it in a way where it's very effective. But here's the difference. Unlike Volkanovsky, Luke does not disguise his stance switches. He's not unpredictable with it. He doesn't use it to faint or he doesn't faint before the stance switch. And he doesn't attack off the stance switch either, right? He just stance switches in place. So that's why his stance switches aren't effective. And that's why he was getting pot shotted. He was getting hit with one twos and takedowns. Jason, do you think it's better for Luke just to abandon the stance switch and just stick to orthodox? I don't know if he should just abandon it, but imagine... Imagine, do you think anyone's getting left kicks to the body off of Volk like uh, like uh, Muhammad was against uh, against Vincente Luque? Like, that's never happening. He's not stationary enough for anyone to just launch that left kick to the body uh, like Bilal was able to time and time again against Vincente Luque. So the the movement and the hand positioning and the like the threats of punches and kicks and feints are are. Re- work really well for Volkanovsky. So in 2016, uh, Vincente Luque's somewhat, uh, he threw like a right kick and then landed in a southpaw position seamlessly and then just sort of gave a little bit of ground to go back to the orthodox position off the drop step. And that's a little more nuanced than just like the, sli- <laughs> the slide and shift. So it, he actually like oversimplified uh, his 2016 movement and then just like robotically in, in a programmed fashion back and forth, regardless of whether it was working, like in that sense, yeah, you got to let it go. It's just not working. But if you do it right, if you do it like he's capable of, if you do it with rhyme and reason, then, then yeah, keep it in your repertoire. It's going to be harder. Uh, but if any time he was giving away those left kicks to the body to Bilal Muhammad, I'm thinking, I'm watching I'm like, Jesus, man, these are scoring and he's, He's getting outstruck 
Babylon Muhammad, and it's his fault. You know what it reminded me of is something you said. You said, clearly, Vicente Luque is not the guy who had a split decision against Mike Perry. <laughs> and normally he's not. But in this fight, the guy who had a split decision against Mike Perry came back. I kept thinking throughout the fight. I was like, even though Muhammad is not turning it into that brawl, Luque is moving and fighting just the same way he did against Mike Perry. Yep. Very, very programmed. Very, very obvious. and uh, Incredibly too predictable. And when you start fighting the top five guys in the world, top 10 guys in the world, like predictability is a problem. And again, these, the, these athletes start to get married to a technique because they usually eventually find it. But if you're not, there is some strategy involved. And if winning is the, like the primary motivator for this thing, okay. But if, if it is not, if it is to entertain and you lose because you are so predictable in your attempt to entertain then you have no one to blame but yourself you, you really don't you can shift gears and you can switch it up and it might not be the most fan friendly but hey you need to pay your bills you need to climb the rankings and if you can mix in a few decisions or there's a tendency for fundamentals to lead to knockouts rather than searching for that knockout oh so like up your on base percentage, get some base hits, get some singles and doubles. And then, then, you know, I'm going to throw a lot of baseball metaphors at you. <laughs> um, and then you start to get some timing and then you get the, you know, you get a, you're a, a right-handed power hitter and you get a, you get a South clock coming in and you get that outside foot position. Well, let's play the fucking hits kid. Cause they're coming. So you got, you got to find it. You got to see it. You got to set it up. You got to read it. You just can't swang and bang. If you love the Southpaw Project, please support us and help us get paid for our labor, by financially supporting us on Patreon. It'll help us supplement the cost of running this project, the incredible time and energy we put into it 7 days a week. And you'll be giving us some breathing room, not only to juggle Southpaw with our day jobs, but also to expand Southpaw into other areas. Show your Southpaw solidarity, by supporting us, at patreon.com slash southpawpod. Now, Muhammad used a wrestling strategy that reminded me a bit of Tyron Woodley in his prime, which is to move around the perimeter. So when you're trying to take someone down, you're taking them down into open space. And it seemed like Muhammad, at least against Luke, felt he would have better success in taking him down in open space than trying to take him down against the fence. And I think part of why Luque's takedown defense looked good prior to this fight is because he's normally fighting off takedowns while his back is against the fence. But here he couldn't do that. And it made me think about how fighters back in the day were so good with their sprawl defense game. Then they began to get taken down against the fence. But now fighters are getting so good at takedown defense against the wall you're seeing a return to open space, but now with a new wrinkle, which is taking the back as fighters turn away to escape. So it seems like as strikers get good at one type of takedown defense, the wrestlers are figuring out another way to take them down and then make them pay, making wrestling and takedowns relevant again. And it's like, you can't spend all your time on sprawling because if you do, you're bad at takedown defense against the fence. So you start spending more time doing that and then your sprawling game starts suffering yeah no doubt and this this brings us back to like traditional wrestling um and the the dynamics of play in uh wrestling in a, in a cage where like secondary and tertiary shots usually bring you up into that high hip position that high crotch position and it's it's very, very tiring because you would normally run through someone. You can hit a perfect double leg takedown and run them. And all of a sudden they're bouncing back all that reverb of their energy back into you because you hit the cage and you heard commentary talking about finishing in an L over and over. You you don't necessarily have to finish in an L if you start on the perimeter and you run someone across a 25 foot cage. And that's what, that's what Bilal was doing. So like, as the game starts to evolve, you're going to see strategy and counter strategy. This guy wants to forward pressure me. Okay, I'm going to catch him coming in. And I might be two and three. And this is why the, the commentary strikes me as a little bit odd. These are supposed to be some thought leaders in mixed martial arts. 
but they keep a- keep acting like giving ground is giving away your firstborn. I mean, holy shit. They, you didn't realize that it's been working for fighters for decades and that there is there is a strategy to it, especially f- from from the commentators who have an understanding of wrestling. It's like you you can you can shoot off that back foot, especially when someone is coming in, marching forward, hands high, and they swing in a miss, and that rotates their hips to you. You've actually beaten them easily, and you get that takedown in the center of the cage. And when those hips are turned and twisted, as you attempt to counter rotate, that's where you see a lot of those back takes. Because it's either you can see the guard. You take guard and you can you can see the top position or you have to counter rotate your hips, come across your body and start to we talked about the C grip, the dog collar, that that head push and slide away. And that and now there's a lot of real estate that the wrestler has to take that back before you can use the cage to keep them from turning that corner where you give up your back partially and then you use the cage and they can't magically morph through it. So. You can impede their um, their follow and make it hard for them to, to continue to pursue. You do that in the center of the cage, it becomes that much easier to continue those grappling sequences and, and solidify that back position. Now, what did you think about Muhammad's striking defense? And what would you like to see more of? I don't think his striking defense is great. It's just not. He relies more on movement, right? Absolutely. Perfectly. That's what I was going to say. Um, you don't have to that much when when you're when you're moving that often and part of his striking defense is timing this like lunging jab at you when you're just pursuing and it's him determining you said it before he dictates when he sets his feet and goes and you it, it's hard to do because you have to start watching his feet to see when he's planted and if you do that then his hands are poking you in the face like you're getting punched in the eye you're getting punched in the nose you're getting punched in the jaw Um, so it it brings us back to the point where I say like sometimes resetting is, is your best option to keep them from dictating where and when they decide to go and go big. But if you go back to 2016 and you say, Hey, Bilal, we're going to run forward with this weird one, two, as we throw a right hand, Luke is going to same side, high block and return left hook. Where's your hand position going to be? It's he's still doing that same shit now, but he's not running with that kind of offense. His defense is being being out of range, setting things up off of either his quick shots um, or his his wrestling entries and his diversified attacks. Um, whether or not they're meant to to hurt or disrupt, disrupt they do. So you, know, you either you either deal with it. But you deal with repercussions of being put on your back. And that's what he does over and over and over. Now, we've talked about Luke's left hook earlier in this episode, but also in the previous episode where we previewed this fight. And though it wasn't a fight finisher, Luke rocked Muhammad with the left hook a couple of times. So what do you think leaves Muhammad open for that left hook? Because I'm sure other fighters will be looking for it. I mean, some of it's got to be... Uh, just Luke's ability to find it. And so Luke has this, has this thing where he'll, he'll protect and return same side. So if you throw a right hand, he's protecting high left, right? And then he's throwing a left hook. So if you're not disciplined of bringing, bringing that right hand back, he'll find your chin where I think Luke had some success because he didn't, I don't think he hit those left hooks as counter left hooks. I think they were more like offensive leads. I'd have to watch the sequence again, but I'm pretty sure they were. The thing about a straight shot against someone who's shuffling left and shuffling right and shuffling left and shuffling right is you're throwing straight while they're beating you to the side. Well, if you lead them or time them in that direction, now you're coming outside in and they're shuffling towards that that looping shot or that hooking shot. I think that's where Luke can have some success or maybe had some success against Bilal Muhammad, anticipating some of that movement. And the left hook is a money shot for Vincente Luque. And I think he, it's one of those things that he's going to have success with in, virtually against anyone he fights. Now, Bilal Muhammad, I, I don't know if it's uh, 
if it's a vision thing, if it's uh, a tendency to, to drop that right hand in, in anticipation of a takedown or to feint a takedown. But um, when you're when you're moving that much, count counterbalance is very difficult to keep your hands up that high the entire time. So there are some some defensive lapses that whenever you do give up ground and you sort of do get pressured against the cage and you can't give up any more, that those hooking shots will find their mark. Because we were talking about this also via text when Pat Sabatini was fighting, where he looked great, he mauled his opponent on the ground, but we were talking about how he's still susceptible to that left hook. So there's something about the left hook that seems to be harder to see than a lot of other punches. So what makes the left hook in general such a hard punch to see? I, I really don't know. And I, I, so for years, there was like a lack of good left hooks in MMA, right? <laughs> for a long time. Yeah. And then every, like every MMA coach, like, oh, you can't throw a true left hook and pivot that hip because you're going to get taken down each and every time which isn't true if it's well set up. I mean, if you're in a boxing stance, if, if you're coming out there like, like Joe Frazier, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I really don't know. It's, it's something that I'm seeing more and more of. Um, Chandler seems to get hit with left hooks quite a bit. I'm not exactly sure why. It's a, it's a punch that people have a tough time seeing. And I, maybe it's because when people were training – uh, they're just bombing overhand rights the entire time. So you're focused on that side of the body. I don't know, but you're also seeing jabs start to land a lot more. And no one has the ability to slip a jab any anymore in MMA. You're either, <laughs> e you're either eating it and getting lucky with your own overhand right, or you sort of, instead of like slipping and splitting that jab, you're eating one and you're counter jabbing. I mean, I'm seeing these guys just rock and sock and robots in the face with like jab, jab, jab because no one can get their head off center line. I'm wondering with some of the, the more, so the three fighters we just named, right? Sabatini, wrestler, grappler, um, Bilal Muhammad, wrestler, grappler, and then... Um, Michael Chandler. Yep, wrestler, power puncher. Um, you know, when you're, when you're grounded and heavy-footed and turning big, like, you might be more uh, inclined to... Like have a better like stationary position and react correctly, and maybe the movement throws them off. But like two of the three aren't moving like like Bilal. So I mean that premise is a little faulty. I think it's lack of visual training because they're wrestlers. So in wrestling, I knew wrestlers and grapplers who were legally blind, and you wouldn't know because it doesn't matter when you grapple, right? <laughs> because once you are in contact, then it's so much less about vision and it's so much more about feel. And even if you have great vision, as far as like, you know, if you go to the optometrist, you don't need glasses, you have 20-20, think about the training you get. Because a lot of wrestlers don't do any other sports. You might be one of the few who makes baseball references, right? Because you're more well-rounded. But you know, a lot of wrestlers, that's the only sport they do. So they don't get that eye training from a ball coming towards them where they have to get used to depth, where it's a curveball, where it's a football, where it's soccer, where it's something coming towards them in all kinds of odd angles, right? And they have to be able to see from their whole periphery and also be able to see depth, right? Boxing trains you for all of this. But I think when wrestlers come into MMA and MMA is the first context where they have to learn how to strike depth, periphery, they're going to pass an eye exam. They go to an optometrist, their eyesight might be fine, but they're just not trained to see those things. That's why I think the left hook or even something as simple as the jab becomes so much more effective in MMA than in boxing because wrestlers, they can't see it. Well, you touch on, on several points that are, that are absolutely perfect. Number one, the visual acuity that you get from striking um, is, is very important. Wrestlers tend to get less of it. Because if they are getting pieced up, they take you down. And now the repetition and exposure is, isn't the same. And what you, what you mentioned, like my team, I took, I don't know if you know who Jason Soso is. Um, he was a 130-pound world champion coached by Chino Rivas. I took Felder to that gym. I took my, my striker's and wrestler's 
to uh to Tina Rivas gym in Cherry Hill where um Jason Sosa, Nate Rivas, um a farmer who is a world champion and they they would get boxing rounds, just boxing rounds. That's it. Because that kind of visual acuity in response is is something that oh, well, it's, uh, the sports are totally different. Yeah, man, but if you can make a fighter better by juggling, go fucking juggle, man. Get three tennis balls. And if his hand-eye coordination, if his visual acuity improves, then that's great, especially if their strength is is striking or power punching or even wrestling, but their deficit is not being able to get out of the way, not if they're defensively weak, then it can get better if you force them where they're uncomfortable, where even a Muay Thai fighter, if he's getting pieced up, he's just gonna he's gonna, he's gonna put you in the Thai clinch. He's gonna like move you around. It's gonna be inside close quarters, and a lot of those things will be out of play. A good fight. I mean, you're not getting thousands of boxing rounds by themselves and ignoring the other disciplines, but there is something to the visual acuity, the hand-eye coordination, the response to strikes coming at you, strictly punches that will make you better at seeing them. And kind of interpret, interpreting and interpolating that kind of data. Where's that punch coming? Where are the shoulders? And when you start to see and start to anticipate, you make better reads and you get better at it. But a lot of fighters don't like to break from outside of their comfort zone. And there also is that sort of aversion to boxing rounds as if somehow you're just going to start Philly shelling everything and like, yeah, all your, your MMA footwork will go to complete shit. That's just not going to happen if you're well coached and you have someone guiding it, or if like, you're a smart fighter and can make some some decisions uh, based on where you need improvement. But I'm all for boxing rounds to make an MMA fighter defensively more sound. I don't think you should be shelling up. I don't think you need to fight in a half man, um, but you should be getting some rounds against someone who's, who can box and piece you up. And I think you can get improved reaction time, fundamental defense, and just better visual acuity for fighting in general. Now, Muhammad seems to have a hard time hurting opponents with his shots. Do you see anything with his punching mechanics that could be the problem? Yes. For a big, strong guy, he's all over the place, uh, which is why he wins a lot of decisions. I mean, he's he's herky-jerky, and he's not ever really fully planted. So he's not getting a lot of power stuff off. But when you mentioned Tyron Woodley playing the perimeter and throwing that right hand, Woodley wasn't able to follow up with a lot of wrestling because everything was put into that right hand. So he so he got some knockouts, but he didn't get a lot of takedowns off that shot. If if La Muhammad lands that right hand, he's running through your hips while you're blinking off that shot. And so, and so that's the difference there. One has their foot set and it's just driving through, turning, twisting, and rotating that force from back foot to front foot, rotating through the fist and through your opponent's head. And the other one is poking you to straighten you up. His feet are still underneath him because he didn't push back foot to front foot with any other reason than to get his level to drop and run through your hips. So think of that right hand is if it does some damage, great. If it straightens you up and get your hands high well it's an easier path to and through your hips and that's i think that's how bala muhammad plays it so the context is different yeah muhammad called out kobe covington after the fight how do you think they match up style wise it's an interesting call out and i really like it because for blau it gets him into the the title talk right and covington's a maga douchebag so i really like it um but Style wise, they both have very good cardio and very good wrestling and in good chance. They're both both very durable. But if there is an obvious advantage, it's going to be Covington's volume. Now, is the the wrestling ability of Muhammad good enough to keep sort of that like spammy Covington offense, you know, holstered a little bit? And I don't know. Like, that's the question I want to know. Because sometimes, I mean, in a, a college wrestling match, it's, it's Covington all day. You put them on, line them up in the center of the server, in the center of the mat. It's going to be Covington all day. But MMA wrestling is a different thing. We've touched on it before. Muhammad is a very physically strong dude who doesn't tire. And if you come at him with that kind of, like, spammy offense, can he, 
can he sneak a takedown or two? Knowing how intelligent Muhammad is, I don't think he called out Covington just because he doesn't like him or he thought it was a big money fight. I think him and his camp must have seen something in studying Covington. So it was a strategic call out where they think this is somebody that's high enough in the ranks that they could beat and then get a title shot. So I'm curious to see what Muhammad's camp saw in Covington that they think this is the right call out. I don't think this has anything to do with emotions. I think they saw something and they're like, this is a guy we can beat. I don't know what they saw. I don't know how they think the styles match up. But now this camp has really proven to me and Muhammad has really proven to me that they're really smart and intelligent about game planning. Oh, agreed. And here's what I think that they are considering, right? Same thing, same thing you and I talked about when we were talking about how, who might pose problems for Kobe Covington. And it's someone who is going to be durable, well-conditioned, and good wrestling. I think anyone like that can keep it close with Kobe Covington. And at this point, it, what's, what's your best route uh, in terms of matchups for, for getting a top two, top three guy and, uh, and putting yourself in position for title contention? And I think that the Covington fight might be it. I think Muhammad must also be pricing in. He doesn't think Covington can finish him. He doesn't think Covington will knock him out which also then only leaves them worrying about the decision. Yeah, and that's that's a smart fighter like Muhammad who can bank a round or two. You admit you make it a close fight and you solidify one round. Like that's that's probably something that they're seeing knowing that the things you need to approach a fight with Covington are durability, conditioning and wrestling. And Covington can beat fighters that are like statistically better than him if they don't have those things because he's so well conditioned and he's such a good wrestler and like his and there's no one saying that Covington striking is good it's actually <laughs> terrible but but his his offensive output is is really high volume and for a person that punches so and kicks so oddly he he lands them a lot so like the the things that Mohammed's camp recognize are probably some of the things you and I touched on when we were discussing who would be a good matchup for Covington and can maybe uh, knock him out of the top three. All right. That's it for this fight study. If you enjoy what we do, please support the Southpaw Network on Patreon. Thanks for listening. Always a pleasure, folks.